welcome back to Bizarre Podcast Space Puppets. My name is Grant, you can call him Chip, and today, today we are beginning the second season of Farscape. I was very curious to see how they start this off, um, because <laughs> uh-huh. you split the cast in half, you threw two of them just out in space with one of them dying. Mm-hmm. Uh, it started, it's, th- this starts different than I thought it would. <laughs> yeah. I have also heard that this was not originally the first episode of season two. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Like in production, they saw like what was meant to be the first one and decided, mm, let's put that further back and bring the one where everyone gets reunited up to be first, even though they, they were produced in the opposite order. Right. So we're going to be catching up with what was at, on the drafting table or, and even during filming meant to be first before that decision was made. Eighth. We'll, we'll be talking about that wow. next month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very curious what that episode is going to be like if that was originally planned for, for the first of the, mm-hmm, of the season. Mm-hmm. But uh, before we get into it, I think there's a lot of stuff we should cover. For one, this is a brand new season, which means this mm-hmm. episode will always be uh, uh, freely publicly available, while the rest of the show is a premium exclusive thing. If you want to get the rest of season two or the rest of season one before it, the best thing you can do is be a donor at any level, at any amount at patreon.com slash chip and ironicus. And if enough people do that, if we cross the $2,600 a month uh, threshold, everything comes back out. We, we've been wavering over our season one uh, coverage on both sides of that line. So things mm-hmm. have, have popped out uh, uh, bit by bit. But, but if you want uh, it to be reliable and regular, the best thing to do is to be a, a uh, patron yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, But yes, we are continuing to talk about the entirety of Farscape. Uh, uh, We're we're coming back for season two. I would like to ask you to give the listeners a rundown of all our major characters, who they are, and uh, uh, what sort of journeys they've been on and where we left off with them in the season one finale. Uh, uh, family ties. So uh, this is in the order they are credited in the opening uh, uh, in in the opening theme song, and then uh, after those people run out, the, the very significant characters that don't get credits in the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which means, uh, please please tell everybody uh, in a nutshell about John Crichton as portrayed by Ben Browder. Yeah, uh, John Crichton, American uh, astronaut for IASA, not NASA. Ayasa, very important, Mm -hmm. uh, who uh, goes on a a big uh, experiment uh, for taking like small spaceships and like, you know, whipping them around, skimming the (laughs) the fucking the orbit of a planet to like build up incredible speed. Uh, It goes way too well. He flies through a wormhole. Just whipping him around. John Crichton doing devil sticks in space. Hell yeah. (laughs) Uh, Ends up somewhere way else in... Uh, w- somewhere way different in in the universe uh immediately accidentally has a guy fly into him and die and that's very important <laughs> uh very quickly gets wrapped up in a whole bunch of bullshit with a whole bunch of other aliens and uh is chased by the peacekeepers the the big like space space renta cops slash nazis mm-hmm. of the universe uh, the 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 Rent-a-Cop Empire. Yeah, the Rent-a-Cop Empire. <laughs> Wonderful thing to say. Mainly being hunted down by Bylar Crace. Who we'll the, get to. He's yeah. on my list. Yeah. And kind of the the big thing with John going throughout the entire series is kind of both him uh acclimating to the fact that he's in a very different alien part of the world, uh having to get used to the fact that he is the only human anywhere. No one's ever heard of Earth or seen a human before this despite Sebastian's looking exactly the damn same uh, as all the other main characters are kind of doing the whole found family thing with all the other criminals and escapees and random people that eventually get on the ship along with him uh, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. Know, learning to, to trust each other and all that shit. And yeah, the whole time he's, he's trying to figure out a way home, try to recreate wormholes eventually gets wormhole information beamed into his brain, which is very important to the peacekeepers. And so now he has an, a, a second reason why everyone wants to chase him and pull <laughs> his brain out of his head. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, you know, when we get to her, uh, he is 
also like very quickly ro- starting to get uh, romantically involved with uh, Aaron soon. So, yeah, I, I think the most important thing about John Crichton at this point is like procedurally. Yeah, he, he got the wormhole in him, mm-hmm. uh, but character wise that he has become a citizen of the, the uncharted territories out here. Right. Yeah. By the, uh, by this point, he's when's the last time he's dressed up in his I gear. I ask you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. His dad's lucky ring has been lost uh, to, to yeah. space. He, he is much more acclimated by the, by the end of season one. You know, he is able to roll with all the insane shit that happens much better. Now he very quickly adapted to, you know, the, <laughs> all the, the new technology and science and, and yada yada, because, hey, he's he's a very smart boy. But yes, as you mentioned, next up is Officer Aaron Soon, uh, portrayed by the great Claudia Black. So we got Aaron Soon, who uh, was a peacekeeper soldier who got tangled up in, you know, the first episode with John and everyone else. Uh, the, the peacekeepers have a Law about you spending a large amount of time with other aliens means that you are contaminated and must be, you know, essentially just executed, put to death because you are now no longer like pure or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, So she at first is unwillingly stuck with John and the rest of the cast aboard Moya. uh, And slowly over time, she begins to lose her her sense of being a peacekeeper soldier and becomes more of her own person through a whole bunch of trials, including, uh, you know, learning how to do things other than just shoot people with guns, which she still <laughs> loves to do by the end of season one. I don't think she will ever not love shooting stuff with guns. Right, um, right. But learning to problem solve, doing science and a whole bunch of other stuff. She's one of the the people who's a bit of a slower burn throughout season one. But yes, by the end, she too has like straight up just said that she no longer considers herself a peacekeeper. All that stuff that she kind of valued and, and held dear from that like that shitty culture, rent-a-cop culture. She realized uh, Mega sucks now because she has friends <laughs> and that's way more fun. <laughs> uh, and still lots of opportunities to shoot people with guns. like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, and yeah. for better oh, yeah. reasons. Uh, Pau Zotozan, as portrayed by Virginia Hay. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, what was it, ninth level Delvian priest? Uh, at the beginning of the season, yes. Yeah. She, along with two other people uh, that we will get to soon, were uh, people aboard a Peacekeeper Leviathan, like, prison transport, essentially, when they escape uh, in the the very first episode. She is a priest who uh, is, quote-unquote, head anarchist, uh, as you learn, (laughs) uh, like, midway through the season, that she was... uh, the Delvians had a, a leader in charge who was essentially just bending the knee to the peacekeepers uh, and selling their whole race out, essentially. And so uh, she did her Delvian priest mind powers to uh, romance the man and then murder him with brain powers. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and her whole thing is, while she be- appears very calm and collected and like serene and, and holy at the start, that is something she achieved through a shitload of thinking and meditating uh, because beforehand, as it is with all Delvians, it's very easy to, while like trying to achieve enlightenment and, and other things, uh, go completely insane. Um, <laughs> and so she has like a a an anger and like a hatred and a, a, a she she's a much more fucked up person beneath the surface, <laughs> and she also always is trying to hold it back. And eventually, she has to fight a space wizard, and that brings a lot of the the, the that back to the surface. Uh-huh, and, uh-huh. and kind of puts a lot of you know cracks into her uh uh more calm like outward personality that she then has to struggle with throughout a lot of you know the second half of the season mm-hmm. um and she's at a point now where she no longer considers herself a priest but it definitely seems like she, seems like she wants to be one again to the point that she's always wearing the priest vestments whenever she thinks she's about to die <laughs> yeah uh, that brings us to Ka Dargo, played by Anthony Simcoe. A guy who I originally thought was, oh, this is just going to be a Klingon, but he's better than that. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> but yes, a, a Luxon who is, you know, Luxons are uh, a very, like, proud kind of warrior race, but they've got more going on culturally than that. Uh, 
But yes, another person who is a, a prisoner at the start of the series, who originally seemed to be prisoner for uh, killing his uh, commanding officer in the past, but really turns out the great crime that he has been framed for is the murder of his wife, who was a, a peacekeeper. He was living with her and his son, uh, like on a, you know, on a on a planet. Uh, mm-hmm. trying to hide, you know, from peacekeepers and stuff because, hey, a peacekeeper married to Alexan is an extremely, like, taboo thing in, in sebation, well, not sebation, peace, peacekeeper culture. But her uh, peacekeeper brother kills her because he has just such a deep-seated grudge against uh, uh, Dargo. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, he is framed for the murder of his wife. Uh, and the main thing is he just really, really wants to get back to his home planet and find his son Jothi, uh, who has a very large head. <laughs> <laughs> that was years ago. He might have grown into it. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that that's still his his big goal. But uh, along the way, he has finally begun to respect John because he was very irritated and annoyed by him <laughs> at for the first many episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's also just got a really good rapport f- with Aaron because, hey, they, they both love shooting the guns. And sometimes your gun is a sword. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, so so now, the, the last entry uh, to the crew so far, Chiana, played by Gigi Edgley. Where's Rigel? Rigel's not in the credits. <laughs> He's not in the credits? Wait a minute. <laughs> I didn't realize. There's clips of Rigel in the credits, but wow. there's no, like, and Rigel played by. What so, the hell? so he's next. He's next. Okay, okay. He has a fairly recent addition, uh, Chiana, uh, who is a, if I remember correctly, Nabari? Yes. Right? Yes. yes. The Grey um, People. Yes, the Grey People. Uh, she is from a culture that is very, like, conformist, it seems, though we haven't learned too much about Nabari culture yet, aside from conformist and they love to uh scrub people's brains so they behave better (laughs) Mm -hmm. um as you described very aptly uh when she was first introduced uh jellicle coded um (laughs) she she is a like young woman who is way into doing what she wants when she wants regardless Mm -hmm. of the rules and and how other people think of her that might include stealing or you know what have you she loves sneaking. She's she the sneaky sneaking. one. And yeah, she's just... Uh, uh, she loves snurching. Yeah, snurching. Uh, <laughs> she's the one with all the weird space slang that even the other aliens go like, what the fuck are you talking about? Um, <laughs> yeah, she's the one that we, we know the least so far, but uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is you know still already you know becoming quick friends with the majority of the cast. And the show really seems to like pairing her up with Rigel. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know how much more they're going to do that but it feels that's an early thing <laughs> of them trying to like get a rapport with with one of the other main of the the main cast um well they're they're uh and i'm sure we'll get to this in just a minute they are the they're the most self-interested yeah yeah so it's it's easy for them to be put together doing schemes mm-hmm. also the the maybe the person of the main cast who's most the most um flippant with straight up murder <laughs> like Dargo and, and and Aaron love shooting their guns and and doing like badass warrior shit. She mm-hmm. immolated a man a couple yes. episodes ago, and she was just like, "Damn, okay, well, cool." <laughs> it didn't bother her that much. So yes, uh, casting uh, his his long long shadow in a sense so over this discussion. Dominar Rigel the sixteenth, voiced by Jonathan Hardy and performed by a talented team of puppeteers. Mm-hmm. Uh, horrible little man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as, as his name suggests and, and how he's always talking about it, he was former ruler of the Hynerian Empire, uh, kicked out by his cousin, his cousin, right? Mm-hmm. And imprisoned by peacekeepers. Uh, he desperately wants to get back and you know re- resume uh, his role as ruler over however many people he is making up this time 600 around. 600 billion. Thank yeah, you very yeah. much. 600 billion. Uh, he, it, despite be constantly talking about how royal he is and, and trying to put up that image, he's just, he's a little gross thief 
Mm-hmm. He's always trying to pilfer everyone's boots off their bodies the instant he thinks they might be dying. He's just so petty. He's, he's so small. Yeah. <laughs> he's very petty. And he has a, a right, a very, very small core deep in the center of him that is a good person that only shows up every once in a while when <laughs> when his, when the situation is so desperate that he goes, oh, man, even I would feel bad if I, I did this. And those moments are nice, though rare. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, he has two modes, which is um, being shitty and, and mean and spitting <laughs> on people or being uh-huh. really sick and pathetic and bundled up in blankets. <laughs> yeah. That's Rigel. <laughs> He's delicate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, y- you know who else has a lot of bad things happen to them? Pilot, uh, voiced yeah. by Lani Tupu and performed by a team of puppeteers. Mm-hmm. Love Pilot. He is the pilot of the ship all leviathans have a a pilot he's from a uh he's a uh from a race of aliens that have kind of like bargained this deal of having like symbiotic relationships with peacekeeper leviathans so that they can have an opportunity to like leave their planet and see space he's stuck in one spot i'm pretty sure he cannot move pretty sure he's stuck in (laughs) in his little control room He's a, a very smart, like, caring person who uh, maybe doesn't get as much credit as that is due for, for the amount of shit he does for everyone all the time. Has a, a pretty close relationship to Aaron now, considering that mm-hmm. she has had, like, pilot DNA injected in her and some of that still lingers in her. So they both kind of share a, a, a knowledge and experience with Leviathans now. Um, they they were making friends even before she got yeah, uh, yeah. biologically bonded. <laughs> yeah. And he's uh he's still a guy I want to know more about. I don't know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But speaking of Lonnie Tupu, he also plays Bialar Crace. Uh yes, the the peacekeeper whose brother was accidentally killed, I guess, by John because his brother just drove straight into John's ship. Um <laughs> Yeah, he just has a big vendetta against John specifically to the point where even though he has great pride in being like a, you know, a peacekeeper that is higher in rank than most uh, commanding his own ship, uh, he basically gives all of that up just to get revenge on John, like ignoring orders, killing his second officer to cover mm-hmm. up the fact that he is ignoring orders. Where we are at the end of the season, he is basically been completely destroyed. <laughs> uh fucking tortured by the peacekeepers but within every ending is its own beginning yeah yeah he crace crace is uh going through it to the point where he's just he is now also kind of sort of renouncing the the peacekeeper life but like in the opposite way of aaron (laughs) the the Mm -hmm. um the very unhealthy way of doing it (laughs) He basically just wants to keep doing peacekeeper shit, but just on his own. Right, right. Because even they have, like, rules, and he doesn't give a fuck anymore. (laughs) Uh, And our our actual newest member of of the cast that we're going to talk about up top, uh, Scorpius, portrayed by the legendary Wayne Pygram. Calm and collected, but very evil-looking space gimp. Um, (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. You look at him and think he's going to have a monster voice. He does, but only when he's angry. Uh, Still a little mysterious because while he is a peacekeeper, he is some type of fucked up weird half breed or something. Um, Mm -hmm. There's something extra going on with him. He's just not a normal sebation. He's half scaring, according to Crace. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, a very like smart, tactical, calm and collected individual uh, who gets what he wants it seems always in the end um his main motivation specifically is going after john because via the the torture the mind reading torture chair he has he knows john has like secret wormhole knowledge in his brain Mm -hmm. and he wants that real bad because that was like the big thing he's been researching on on that that uh secret gamut base before uh it got blown the fuck up in the last episode (laughs) Uh, so our last two characters that are, I think are very significant are not really portrayed by anyone. They are our ships, Moya and Talon. Do you want to tell the people about Moya and Talon? Yeah, Moya's the uh, P- 
peacekeeper leviathan like prison transport from the first episode who has been freed from her control collar you know you never get any dialogue directly from her but her her thoughts and feelings frequently get relayed to the rest of the crew by pilot at this point she is afraid most of the time (laughs) um (laughs) bad things keep happening to and around her yeah if there's an episode that only takes place on Moya, it's because something really bad is happening to her, generally. <laughs> um, you know, she is a, a living ship who, I don't know, about halfway through the series, uh, becomes pregnant uh, with a, a tiny baby leviathan that uh, ends up being a, like, peacekeeper experiment where it's a leviathan that has guns <laughs> just on it mm-hmm. when it's born. I'd say like the 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 two big like character things with Moya is one when she was pregnant she wanted to prove that she was still useful to the rest of the crew, mm-hmm. uh, and two uh, extremely cares about her baby and is sometimes willing to put the rest of the crew at risk to to defend it. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yes, the baby Talon. Um, I don't know how old it is by at by the end of the first season. It feels like two days maybe. <laughs> Uh huh. But but like, what does that mean? You know? Yeah, yeah. If it's a zebra, that thing can already run like seventy miles an hour or mm-hmm. whatever. Yes, Talon, uh, like special peacekeeper Leviathan, born with like guns and and peacekeeper weapons and communication systems and all that jazz. And currently, by the end of the the first season, her, his greatest bond is actually with Aaron, uh, mm-hmm. who is the first to actually like gain Talon's trust and is also the person to name him Talon. But uh, at the end of the first season, is kidnapped by fucking Kreis because he uh-huh. is, uh, he fucking sucks. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I think that's where we left off with with Talon and Moya. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it is season two. It has been a few months since that season one finale aired, which is less of a gap than uh, between oh, wow. <laughs> uh, the home stretch of season one and, and the main stretch of season one. But everything is different now. When it came time to film season two, the Fox studios at Sydney were all booked up. So they got warehouses and converted them into sound stages mm. in the suburbs. Okay. We've got a new producer. We're a few episodes out from a new uh, a composer doing all the music. We got a new VFX house. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rigel has a new head puppeteer. We got a new facial appliance for Dargo, which I'm sure we're going to talk about soon. Oh, yeah. Another huge change is uh, the Sci-Fi Channel saw that, that home stretch of season one, that last five episodes, and thought, wait a minute – we should stop pushing against uh, multiple episode arcs. We want those all the time, as many as possible. Please, <laughs> yeah. please, please. Yeah. Uh, you will note in our uh, season two schedule, there are two three-parters coming up over the course of mm-hmm. this uh, season. And uh, we, we've got more of the not necessarily linked, but still kind of linked things that we certainly had over the last stretch of season one as well Mm -hmm. but another very important uh uh, difference is new corporate ownership Mm. on the henson side i am i am so glad that uh things in your life lined up that i I wasn't saying this to you a couple months ago so uh at this point (laughs) the henson company is owned by a european media holding company oh boy (laughs) oh boy I I hope the wounds aren't still too fresh for us to talk about this. No, it's that's fine. I can just <laughs> laugh about it. So so yes, uh, the the German firm EMTV, hmm. or or more properly EMTV and Merchandising AG, bought uh, the Henson Company uh, in the year two thousand. Okay, and uh, the value of the company immediately tanked. Oh, okay. More on that later, but uh, for now, know that for for the the following three seasons, uh, the Henson Company was not, at its head at least, uh, Brian Henson and his siblings anymore. Mm. Okay. They they had people they answered to now. Mm. That brings us to episode one of season two, Mind the Baby. 
written by Richard Manning, uh, last seen writing Nerve, uh, and directed by Andrew Prowse, uh, who, who directed, of course, the first season premiere and uh, more recently Bone to be Wild. <laughs> mm, okay, okay. So this first episode starts off in a way where the very first shot makes me think, did I start, am I watching the wrong episode? <laughs> <laughs> or because the we, very f- we love an in, an in media res beginning this, oh, this is yeah. the farscape way the very first shot is the she yang vessel from pk tech girl uh-huh <laughs> like powering up and everyone on moya is you know losing their minds because they're about to get blown the hell up um mm-hmm. Rigel's like shouting to pilot to starburst and moya's not ready yet it is pandemonium in there uh the the first thing that makes it feel like wait is you know, this whole scene is off is that uh, when Chiana runs over to Zan, like we got to think of something. Zan is just completely out of her mind. Uh, <laughs> she, just, she's entirely broken with reality. She's praying for, for Dargo to come save them. You know, like he, he yelled at the Xiang before. Yep. And so, yeah, the Xiang fire, they it hits Moya, like pilot screams and his hologram cuts out <laughs> to everyone screaming. The lights are, strobing uh and then we cut hard cut from everyone just screaming to uh dargo unconscious <laughs> on a bed because he's having a nightmare where everyone dies without him yep that's dargo mm-hmm. so yeah dargo's dargo's out of it and john is sitting not too far from him in the same room talking at him hoping that he wakes up soon eventually yeah dargo does wake up uh just you know, breathing hef- heavily, confused, doesn't know where the fuck he is. Because, you know, mm-hmm. last we saw both him and John, they were just fucked and floating in space. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, uh, apparently he's been passed out for a few days. He's been in a coma for days mm-hmm. down with uh, uh, John in this abandoned asteroid mining facility uh, deep in some hidden cove within the, the field that has the gamic base and the bone to be wild asteroid and yep. the the site of the like whole the the asteroid saga i guess <laughs> that ended season one mm-hmm. so yes the reason why both dargo and john are alive is because aaron was finally able to scoop them up and drop them in in this old like abandoned facility mm-hmm. aaron isn't here right now because she's out like scavenging for supplies or food or anything that she can find or at least that's the story, because when we catch up to Aaron, she is in secret and mysterious contact with Crace and Talon. Mm-hmm. And yes, it's it's a lot of talk of Aaron, like, you know, telling Crace that she's risking a lot, you know, staying away from John and and Dargo for so long, uh, to you know contact him and all this. Uh, there's a mysterious deal the two of them have. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's that's just when we cut to the the opening mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. The episode. Uh, I thought there was going to be more new narration from John, but it's still well, he's being pursued by an insane military commander. It's a different one, yeah. But the description you know, still fits. That's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, back with John and Dargo. John's just like quizzing Dargo a lot to make sure that his brain isn't like <laughs> extremely damaged from being in the vacuum of space for a very long time. Basically, in lieu of a previously on Farscape opening, <laughs> yeah, just we we want those minutes for something else. Let's let's make it a character thing and yeah. and keep going. Yeah, Aaron enters the the scene here right after Dargo just shouts like, "Hey, who the fuck named the baby Talon? That's a shitty name." <laughs> <laughs> and so here comes uh, the baby namer, and she's all greasy, dirty, mm-hmm. down to business. You know, Aaron is not spending much time. Like she's delivering supplies, and then she's like immediately leaving again. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Dargo's saying, "Like, hey, I'm alive and conscious now. We can just could we just leave, leave the asteroid field?" And Aaron is like extremely adamant against anyone leaving because right to to the point of irrationality. The yeah. uh, uh, Dargo and John are looking at each other like, "Get get a load of this. What what's going on here?" Yeah, her reasoning is supposed to be is you know there's still marauder patrols and also i don't know of any other facilities on any other asteroids we can hide on but john is also like yeah but if we stay in one spot scorpius is gonna find us and then my brain will get scooped out (laughs) (laughs) 
the, we, a, we do have a repeat of of the classic uh uh misrepeating a mm-hmm. uh uh earth idiom into a sex thing yes when the prowler's fuel runs out we starve as john once said i would rather go down on a swing swinging you want to cut out swinging Swing. The only reason we'll starve is if you don't. There's a decent amount of Dargo jokes in this episode. Yes, yes. Which is maybe my favorite thing in the episode. <laughs> once, once we get to the rock paper scissors part, <laughs> Dargo really loosened up uh, when when he was sent on a suicide mission and lived. Yeah, I mean, I don't blame him. So now we we cut to everybody on Moya. Um, Chiana For real is, this time, not yeah. the nightmare people. <laughs> Chiana is trying to feed Raja what looks like pepperoni. He doesn't want pepperoni. He don't no. want the pepperoni. <laughs> um, Raja doesn't want to eat. He's grumpy. Uh, and it's because, uh, as Pilot says, uh, Moya is turning around and wants to go back to the asteroid field to look for Talon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and like she insists on doing this, so... Everyone's freaked out. Like, hey, we just escaped all the peacekeepers, and now we're flying right back at them. Yeah, the the, the criminals who uh, left that place to avoid uh, capture and perhaps certain death aren't too happy about this. Mm-hmm. Like Chiana is is complaining that like this is very a very bad thing to do because we don't even have any guns to defend ourselves. And Pilot corrects her like we technically have one thing to defend ourselves with. We still have that defense shield from PK Tech Girl. Mm-hmm. And like the camera pans over to it and it's still hooked up and it looks like it's falling apart. <laughs> it, it's just a big heap of garbage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I forgot one thing at the top for people who are just rejoining us as we start mm-hmm. a new season. There is a third uh, uh, host of this program of Bizarre Podcast Space Puppets. Uh, that is the Bodily Fluid Bell. That rings every time uh, uh, body fluids are depicted or otherwise central to a scene. So yep. when I say that we meet Scorpius getting juicy, juicy brain rods shoved into his head, <laughs> you're going to hear this noise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the very first thing you see while cutting to uh, the formerly Crace's command carrier is a woman like, so the, the like cap, the cowl the whatever thing that goes mm-hmm. over most of uh, scorpius's head that you ears... thought those were just his, his headphones he was just banging out his tunes yeah he has these no. caps over where his ear should be and she pushes it in to his skull a little bit and then it just starts uh sliding out of his head like unscrewing and coming out of his head and it like comes out so far that it's like this thing drills all the way through to the other side of his head essentially yes yes uh and the whole time it's and coming it's out it's not just a reverse shot it is still moving and spinning when we're looking straight on this is a yeah. good effect it looks so good yeah and the whole time this is coming out it looks extremely painful because <laughs> scorpius is just like gritting his teeth the whole time and yeah when it pops out all the way there's this uh, glowing rod in the the center of it that is red and she mm-hmm. like this woman like pulls it out and and swaps in a fresh new blue cylinder or rod mm-hmm. and then it drills all the way back into his skull <laughs> uh and it's, it's 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 so it... excited for season two because it's so much weirder than season yeah one. <laughs> it's it's really gross too because this like apparatus that drills out of his head is made out of metal, but there's just tons of like blood and like sinew all like mm-hmm. stuck on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's gross. But yes, once once his head rod maintenance is completed, <laughs> um, is when uh, the, his second command Bracca his shows special up. Special little boy. Yep, and he, he he shows up just telling that like, hey, there's uh, no sign of the Leviathan, no sign of Crichton, absolutely nothing. And Scorpius is in a testy mood right now, <laughs> saying like, because he repeated nothing. He's like, I fucking know what that means. <laughs> but I, I appreciate that this scene lets us know that the reason John and Dargo are alive is because he intentionally backed off the search to allow Aaron to rescue them because John Crichton is no good to him dead. Yep. He backed off knowing that that would let Aaron scoop them up because... 
we'll we'll find them later. And so far, that part of the plan not working out too great. Yeah, Scorpius is like grabbing Bracca by the shoulders and bring him in real close, and just making it very clear that he was fine with letting that first part happen. But you're supposed to capture them after that second part, and yeah. you fucked up, dude. <laughs> and and Bracca is you know uh, very intimidated clearly <laughs> by Scorpius. Mm -hmm. But he he's still, you know, saying what he, he actually believes right now, which is uh, we might not ever find these people. Now they're in really tiny ships and we can't send out like a noise to scare one of them out of hiding anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so Scorpius decides uh, it, it's time for a new plan. We don't learn what that plan is yet, though, because uh, we're we're cutting back to Talon. Where? And Crace is just pacing around uh, the bridge of Talon saying, Talon, please be a good boy and accept <laughs> that mommy never loved you. <laughs> yeah. Be Get a good over boy. it. I'm your new dad. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, all the lights are flickering and everything. Like not, not, nothing is staying powered on because Talon is so upset. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is when Aaron boards Talon. And he's just like, oh, thank God, the babysitter he likes is here. Can you please get him to calm down? Uh, which, yeah. Because uh, in in the like previous uh, season finale, Scorpius had a plan to just like flood this whole zone with radio static to scare the baby, and it'll it'll get skittish, and then they'll find Moya. Mm -hmm. He's doing that now, and it's starting to work. And it just takes Aaron to be like, hey, bud, hey, bud. It's just noise. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah. I I got you, big man. Mm -hmm. Like the whole time Aaron is, you know, being genuinely comforting to Talon, Crace is there too, trying to just like say the same thing she says, but in a way less calming tone to like try to get Talon <laughs> to like him. <laughs> yeah. Talon, these signals mean nothing. They're intended to alarm you and to make you run. Talon. Do not play into the hands of your enemy. Remain right where you are. Crace and Aaron have like a more secretive discussion here. And it's, mm -hmm. <laughs> Crace just tells Talon like, you know, excuse us. We need to talk alone for a moment. But like they're still in Talon. He can hear. <laughs> um, oh, I, I love like just the little bits of the way Crace talks to Talon. Like, you know, hey, uh, remain right where you are. You're brave enough to do that, aren't you? It's it's very like instilling toxic masculinity into yeah, your son. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yep. It's time to be a real man. You're a week old. I expect more from you. <laughs> You're not a coward, are you, baby? <laughs> are you a cowardly child? <laughs> are you a coward, baby? Is my baby a coward? <laughs> no, baby, of mine will be a coward. Uh, <laughs> I love that. There is a baby in the cast. Baby with guns. Mm -hmm. So Aaron is relaying to Crace that, hey, Dargo has regained consciousness. Both he and John are really antsy to leave, like right now. Mm -hmm. um, Aaron's saying, look, I know instantly what you're thinking. I am not going to abandon either of them because that wasn't part of our deal. Crace is saying that he can't leave yet. He doesn't want to leave yet because he wants Talon to get slightly older <laughs> mm -hmm. so it can be a more competent battleship that actually obeys his commands. He's not even old enough to do Starburst yet. Yeah. And Aaron reminds him that like you can't command a Leviathan, you can only persuade, and Crace is just like, well, he's part peacekeeper though. They're the, the peacekeepers are designed to take orders. That's their whole thing. <laughs> uh and so she turns around and just tries to convince Crace, like, can I talk to Talon alone? Just let me do that, and then maybe he'll behave better. Uh, and Crace does not buy that. He won't let her yeah. be alone in Talon. <laughs> it's an important part of the custody agreement that you're not allowed to poison his mind against me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile... So back down in the hidey hole, yeah. <laughs> yeah, John and Dargo are playing rock, paper, scissors. D Dargo is learning rock, paper, scissors for the first time. Dargo throws rock and John's throws paper and Dargo's like, oh, hell yeah, I win. <laughs> and so John has to explain, no, paper covers rock. And he's just like, that's stupid. Rock rock would rip through paper. Rock fucks paper <laughs> up. <laughs> and it's really funny. Yeah, yeah. They really turned a corner uh, when they died together and then both lived. <laughs> yeah. 
it, it really solidifies a bro like friendship when that happens. So you know? we mentioned it a while ago. I don't think there'll be a good time to talk about it. But yeah, what do you think of Dargo's new face? I'm not sure how I feel about it yet, even after seeing it for two episodes, because it in this episode, when I first saw it, I was just like, I thought it was maybe a temporary thing like, oh, he got all fucked up from being in space. And maybe mm-hmm. that is he, the he reasoning. He is darker. He is. He he got radiation burned out there. I guess. Yeah. He, he's, uh, the makeup designer even explains it that way. Like, yeah, he got burned in in the exposure to to okay. the flaming moon. Because that's what I thought it looked like. But then, like, it kept happening. The the following episode I was like, oh, does he just look burnt for the rest of the series now? Because <laughs> yeah, he's darker. Like in some lighting, he looks more like purple now (laughs) Mm -hmm. but (laughs) also it is made of a new material it is a new mold made Mm. with i think maybe even the same material they invented to make scorpius but like you'll notice it moves on his face much more freely like yeah his eyes can do a lot more his nose can do more uh because the the material is not as stiff it took me a little to like realize that's what I was seeing that felt so different because for a little bit, it felt like he was wearing less makeup because I was seeing more of his face (laughs) move. Right, right. It it felt like I was seeing more of the actor's actual face. I'm sure I will get used to it very quickly. (laughs) Yeah, once in their their rock, paper, scissors matches interrupted by Aaron, you know, showing up again. And this is when John and Dargo both get fed up with Aaron being like, evasive of all their questions and like not giving them a good reason for why they can't just leave you know john basically sees right through her like grabs her by the Mm -hmm. arm like hey i know you're hiding something you should probably just fess up now because it's just making things worse to not do that well he he uh leads into it by saying like okay how many times have we saved each other's lives well more than i can count how many times have we been close and she gets really flustered and like doesn't want to answer this question in front of dargo until she says just the once yeah and And then like i put on your dad's clothes is that normal is that how humans do it (laughs) And, you know, John also gets flustered after after she says that and goes like, I don't no, not like that, <laughs> <laughs> which is like, John, you you phrased it poorly. That's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> friend close. Friend close. Friend close. It's like, OK, yeah. Friend close more than once. And so John's like, with all that in, you know, in context, we should be able to trust each other. Right. You should just be able to tell me what's actually happening here so she gives in and reveals this secret deal she uh uh, got a phone call from crace that he was able to to like find her the perfect hidey hole uh in exchange for her crace training talent Mm -hmm. and in in the moment when they are both like suffocating in space she made the hard call yeah you know she tells them both this john's reaction is uh he's not happy about this No. You're helping the guy who kidnapped a child. (laughs) You're helping him be a better kidnapper. (laughs) Yeah. Dargo's reaction is, you should have let us die. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. He was very prepared. He was all for it. He Mm -hmm. loves to die. So, yes, they're both upset that Crace is getting help with, with, with Talon. Aaron's argument that is that right now, Talon being in Crace's control is still better than being in the Peacekeeper's hands. John's reaction to that is, okay, cool. When does he stop being in Crace's rule right now? Yeah. Yeah. When when do we get the baby back? Does that happen? (laughs) Is that part of the plan? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Aaron's at a point where like, she won't give up her position and admit that any of this is bad. (laughs) Uh, Like this is, you know, she's just still firmly and like, this is the best decision that could be made. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like, there's nothing else we can do. And so Dargo's response is, oh, there totally is something we can do. And tongue whips her unconscious. <laughs> and as a reminder for, for people just joining us, uh, uh, it is very, very important to the writing team, to the show's creators, that the characters continue to have tension, that they are willing to act against one another. Yep. That as, as close as they may get, there will be things that they disagree strongly enough on to... Yeah, knock one another unconscious and just do what they think is right. Yeah. Like, after the commercial break, Mm -hmm. John's just like, well, she's going to be mega pissed when she wakes up. And Dargo's like, yep, anyways. (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, so they but, have a rock, paper, scissors for who gets to kill Bylar Crace. Yep. John they wins. both have a great reason. Yeah. Uh, John, like, wants to do it himself because he's, you know, Dargo is still very weak from being uh, in the vacuum of space for who knows how long. Mm-hmm. So meanwhile on Moya, uh, Chiana is marching down the hallways and finds Zan doing a new type of meditating where she's got J.O. crystals she's charging in each hand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, double fisting. Uh, and oh, yeah. Double fisting is the fourth sensation, by the way. I figured it out. Uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> but she is wearing her bead wreath necklace, which I love. I love this costume piece. Mm-hmm. I don't think it comes out enough. Uh, she wore it in um, Thrown for a Loss, I know. The bead wreath necklace looks like when you get a uh, a drink that's got like sugar crystals or salt or whatever written <laughs> on the rim, uh-huh. that's what it looks like to me. It looks like it would taste good. <laughs> but she she is nearly as zonked out as she was in the nightmare, basically. <laughs> yep. Uh, she she's no longer uh, paying attention to to this material mortal world. Crystal time is important. Back off, kid. And Gianna's here trying to like get help from anyone especially zan can we talk to pilot so that we can really try to convince moya to not go back to where the peacekeepers are and zan's response is basically i don't care <laughs> <laughs> it's crystal time shut up yeah so back with aaron and dargo uh aaron just starts just tells dargo like hey uh you've killed all three of us now if we don't have Crace's and Talon's help, like we're never going to get out of the asteroid field. We're going to die here. Either mm-hmm. the peacekeepers will get us and kill us, or we'll starve to death. And you know, cargo's are cargo. Wow, cargo. Don yeah. cargo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's what they haul on Moya to to uh, make money. Da cargo. Da cargo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aaron's argument is like, well, hey, maybe Crace isn't as bad now because he no longer considers himself a peacekeeper and. Dargo's response is, I don't believe that. No, (laughs) he sucks. He might be even worse now because he only has loyalties to himself. So he's going to be like extra duplicitous. And yeah, as soon as Dargo talks about how Crace is solely motivated by self-interest, we cut to Crace, who is on the phone with Scorpius. Yes, yes. (laughs) He's trying to bargain his way like back into not being in mega trouble, kind of. Um. The first thing he reports to Scorpius is like, hey, I got the little baby gunship. And Scorpius goes, I don't give a fuck. Do you have John <laughs> Crane's brain? That's what I want. So, so yeah, the deal they have is uh, as long as he can deliver John Crichton's living brain, he gets to keep Talon and Scorpius won't fucking care. He's got priorities. Yep. Crace is trying to convince him like, hey, d- you know, I, I can... I can deliver. I'm like in conversation with Aaron right now. I know where the other two are. This is a delicate matter. You got to give me time. Uh, but eventually I, w- I will deliver John to you. So please don't hang up on me. <laughs> <laughs> and and Crace is just like, damn, I heard that you have like incredible patience. You seem very impatient right now. And Scorpius's response is, yeah, I have, in- you know, my patience is formidable, but uh, also I'm really pissed off and my patience is not infinite. So so Scorpius hangs up and Crace is like, hey, Talon, did you hear that? Did you hear about how peacekeepers only think of you as a tool? That sucks. That's why you should do everything I say and no backtalk, young man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're such a yeah. shitty dude. <laughs> it's really funny in the, this previous episode and also continuing into this episode, Crace is basically almost constantly realizing why being a peacekeeper sucks ass and then he just keeps <laughs> doing it yes i love to picture a, a bylar crace wearing the i'm not the stepdad i'm the dad that stepped up t-shirt <laughs> yeah. but the kids hate him so much you can feel it hmm. the cycle of the cycle of violence and abuse sucks better perpetuate it <laughs> and while crace is in the middle of this john just swoops in with his gun drawn doing shtick yeah yeah (laughs) both of these episodes but this episode especially john is pretty unhinged (laughs) yes yes he shows up like pointing the gun at crace and crace turns around like john and he like 
points the pistol away from him with his hands up, just like, oh, I know, I know, I should have called you, and all this shit. And he's he's just, like, out of his mind, just <laughs> joking around, because, like, it feels like he could just shoot Crace in the head at any moment. <laughs> mm-hmm. So they have one of their uh, uh, standoffs. Really, this is the first time they've been face-to-face since the evil wizard. <laughs> Yeah, there, there, there's no no barrier in between them. Having one of them strapped in the chair does not count as face to face. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's that's a different situation. So crazy, just asking John, like, hey, why why are you here? What do you want? John wants a whole bunch of things. The first being, uh, Crace dead. Yeah, where Crace is, you know, acting very calmly is like, oh yeah, I know you could kill me very easily right now, but um, hey, I'm basically this little baby's dad now, and the baby be mad, and he has guns, and he would shoot you if you hurt, hurt his dad. But what John wants more than anything is for that to not be the case, and he's willing to die if, if it means a crace free talon. Yeah, yeah. And so Crace is you know, trying to bargain with John, going like, okay, well, consider this. Uh, neither of us want Talon in, in Scorpius's clutches. To which John admits, like, sure, okay, what do you want, though? <laughs> and he, Kreis just wants to escape. He wants to go deeper mm-hmm. into the uncharted territories. Quote, to re-examine my path, which is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. Which, which, of course, makes John Crichton do some uh, midlife crisis jokes. Mm-hmm. You want to have a midlife crisis? Fine. That just ditch the firm, head off to Maui, shack up with the supermodel, but you do not get to keep the Porsche. You don't get the keys to Moya's baby. So Crace at this point is just like, mm, it's not working. So he just tells Talon, hey, there's an intruder in here. And out come the giant guns made of knives. <laughs> Why are the guns so sharp looking? <laughs> Ceiling mounted knife guns yeah. point at John Crichton as he takes Cray's hostage inside his stepson. Yep. Yeah. At gunpoint, John just drags Crace out of out of the ship. Back on Moya, things are getting a little bumpy as Moya heads uh, uh, and accelerates back toward Talon's last known location where Talon is transmitting. All all this is very scary for baby. Mm-hmm. I like the little detail right at the start of this scene where Rigel is sleeping in his little hover chair. And because Moya accelerates, the chair just starts sliding backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that Chiana calls this uh, Moya going, quote, full lunatic mother mode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Chiana is just trying to think of anything that they can do. And she goes, oh, wait, Moya still has... Uh, Crichton's like you know little ship in it that the Farscape is still there uh, and both her and Rigel just think about uh, what if we just left what if these we left two the ship? are just gonna run away in smaller and smaller craft until they're just <laughs> backpacking through space yeah and like <laughs> even though they're whispering pilot can still hear all this so you just get a cut of pilot just making a really pissed off little face <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> grumpy pilot mm-hmm. and he's like okay you know you could just take the transport pod if that's what you want to do if you want to abandon us and sean is like no uh, nope no who said anything about no 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 they, they also mention uh how you know moya stuck with them during zan's trial mm-hmm. which we'll come back to in a number of weeks mm-hmm. but they have arrived in the asteroid field uh, Scorpius knows we get like a five second insert of Bracca yes. telling him. Yeah. They're also like completely in silhouette walking down this hallway, which makes me wonder if it was 80 yard and those are random other people <laughs> and not <laughs> the actual actors because it, it's such a quick insert shot. And so, yeah, Moya is getting closer to the, the source of the transmission. And this is when pilot detects, hey, there's a little uh, uh, a prowler approaching us, not hailing us or anything, just flying at us, mm-hmm. which leads to Chiana realizing, Holy shit, maybe Aaron's still alive. Just just let the let the ship fly in. And so she greets John and Crace, who come out of the prowler at rifle point. Mm-hmm. Because even though this isn't happening this episode, Shiana has the 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 wits to just go, Well, there could be another alien that looks like people I know. <laughs> 
Uh, John offers to let her check his birthmarks, and she does not find the offer unappealing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, eventually she realizes, is convinced, like, okay, this is the real John. And so she leaps into his arms, like, Wushan, like, wire trick style. (laughs) She's a cat. Cat. This is a cat. She is a cat. Cat, cat, cat. It's, yeah. Again, Angelical coded this this leap she does. When this happens, Crace is thrown to the floor, and we just see a shot of a little <laughs> DRD with its gun pointing at his face, like running into his head over and over, like bumping into him, which is very funny. <laughs> I love these little guys. Uh, so, John, so the, who is like the next challenge, John must face. Yeah. How do you convince your friend you're real and not a ghost? Yeah. So currently, John's mood has swung to uh, a different type of unhinge, which is like happy in like a completely manic state. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, he swoops into Zan's room, just go like, "Hey, what's up? What you doing? Holding some crystals? That's cool. Can, <laughs> uh, can you hear and see me?" And Zan as she did with Chiana, is still just staring straight ahead, unblinking, and does respond, but just barely. Just like, yep, can I can hear you. You okay? Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, surprised to see me? No. Cool. Because she's been seeing John. Mm-hmm. She, she believes that he is dead, and this is just a, a projection of his psyche, either spiritually or in her mind from from... Their, their time of unity and it's like oh yeah spirit john you'll always be real to me it's okay you don't have to know you're dead yeah john cannot convince her otherwise and there's a point where she like reaches out her hand and does like a little little bit of the the pau like brain meld stuff that level 10 cheek touch is no joke he gets thrown across the room <laughs> yeah so chiana is just like whispering like what what the fuck is wrong with her and he's just like nothing really she's just in one of her weird moods <laughs> but but yeah she she is recommitting herself to the delvian seek she she will be a priest once more but apparently that means just being totally unavailable to anyone uh and so we cut to dargo playing rock paper scissors with himself yes it's pretty funny <laughs> yes you got to do something to kill the time uh they're stranded they're they're waiting for someone to get them uh, and on the bright side, whichever one of them dies first can eat the other. Yep. Yay. Yay. Uh, and this is when John comes back, you know, informing uh, everyone that like, hey, I got one of the two things done. <laughs> I, I got Craze out of Talon. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, we're, we're seeing Scorpius like walking back to his big cushy office where like he and and Brack are strat- strategizing more on you know how to capture the Leviathan and John and all that stuff. Everyone is is leaving now. The command carrier sees it, and so the plan is to disable both ships uh, and send boarders to take Crichton alive. Fuck the rest. Mm-hmm. And this whole plan hinges on neither Leviathan initiating starburst, uh, Talon because it's too young. And Moya won't because Moya won't jump away from Talon again. Yep. So we get a shot here of, you know, Moya flying through space with Talon in tow. And so John walks in to command where Rigel is being a sleepy boy. Uh Uh-huh. And then (laughs) he's so happy. (laughs) He's very happy. He's He's so happy he almost dies. Yeah, he's very so happy that he starts choking and coughing and he's unable to breathe. Uh, And this is apparently a thing that happens to Hynarians when they're very excited. Their their throat just seizes up. (laughs) I would also be a totally detached asshole if caring too much put me in anaphylactic shock. (laughs) I feel like this explains so much about Rigel and Hynarian society. Yep, yep. It's a cute scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, both John and Dargo are very amused at this and basically make fun of him for caring. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, hey, we got everybody back on Moya now. Yeah. Yay. Even Kreis. Uh. N- uh, yeah. So, so Pilot comes in and is like, okay, here's the problem. The kid's all fucked up. The kid's all fucked up the because baby's everyone three. who ever talks to this baby hates each other. It's so confused. Yep. 
this baby's three days old and it's already pretty traumatized. <laughs> and so, you know, Moya consents to Aaron talking to Talon to try to help calm him down, help him make sense of everything that's been happening. But it's it's not quite working. Uh, John tries to tell Aaron that like, hey, maybe we should give it a rest right now. He's so confused. Maybe just let him, you know, spend some time alone and, and sort the shit out. Mm-hmm. And then John goes to leave, uh, leaves to go talk to Pilot. And Talon is so confused on who to trust, who to listen to, what to do in this weird situation where everyone is yelling at everyone, mm-hmm. uh, that Talon wants to just, like, fly away and be alone. And Moya, as a concerned parent, is chasing, which is making Talon more nervous. Mm-hmm. Oh, poor thing. Oh. So, yeah, John asks, like, hey, is there any sight of the command carrier yet? To which Pilot says, like, no, that it's it's nowhere near us currently. Cutting back to Zan, she is waving one of her crystals in the air, and it makes a bunch of little goofy sound like, effects. <laughs> it hums. Bell tones. Yeah. Using the force. Yeah. Aaron's watching this happen. She's basically going, hey, what you doing? <laughs> are you, are you going to be done with the crystal shit soon? And uh, Zan's answer is no. Mm-hmm. I will never be done with the crystal shit. <laughs> She she's entered a, a new phase of of her uh, like spiritual practice, and she wants Aaron to know that she loves her. She says, "I love you." Mm-hmm. And if John Crichton ever says that, it'll be his last words. <laughs> and this is a thing that catches Aaron off guard, and she like very really quickly stands up, gets off the bed, and like is trying to say shit and like stammering a whole bunch. And then Zan says. I love you like I love all beings. I'm just in that kind of state now. Mm-hmm. Cool. And so Aaron says, well, fuck you then. Yeah. <laughs> no, you don't. Or you'd be helping, you freak, you selfish little creep. Mm-hmm. Spirit. I am now going to devote my life to enlightenment. Oh. Well, I think that's um, really selfish, actually. You know, before you bliss off completely into oblivion, you might want to have a little look around you because Moya and Talon are in danger. Worldly concerns do not interest me now. Oh, really? Well, then don't give me any dren about how much you love me. Love in its most rarefied sense. Too rarefied for me. I'm just an ignorant warrior who believes that love means you're willing to fight and die for your fellow living beings. And so, yeah, Aaron just kind of storms off, pissed off that... Zan is not being helpful in any way right now, uh, which mm-hmm, leads to mm-hmm. Zan waving the crystal around with more force, which makes it sound like the invisible bells that she she's touching like break, like they just shatter into a million pieces. So, so yeah, we have uh, a little philosophical side plot about Zan navigating her her ideals and her personal connections. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed, this is a Richard Manning episode. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> So, Crace has been thrown back in a cell, and this time it's Dargo who, who's guarding, uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, sitting across from Crace and, and having a one to one. So, yeah, Crace is just like asking Dargo or, or, or stating Dargo's, you know, backstory out loud at Dargo. Mm-hmm. Because essentially, this is a season premiere. We got to catch people up. We got to know that, like, all right, we got a weird spiritualist lady. Mm-hmm. The, here's a, a quick uh, check on the backstory of, of this guy. It's It's got its very functional pieces, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but basically, Crace is here saying, I love farms. I hate miscegenation. Yep. But I recognize I should work on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I love when Crace says this shit because, like, in the previous episode... When he says some stuff to John about, uh, I realize now that you didn't kill my brother. It was an accident, blah, 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 blah. It sounds somewhat heartfelt, like maybe he's really considering that stuff. In this episode, 100% sounds like he's just saying whatever he can to placate anyone yeah, to his yeah. advantage. <laughs> like, there, there's, it's so transparent in this episode. <laughs> Dar- and it's not working on Dargo. Dargo's like, oh, yeah, well, if you just sit in that cell for a few years, maybe you'll uh, have plenty of time to think. How about that? How about mm-hmm. that? Mm-hmm. Maybe we should run chains through your clavicle. How do you like them apples? Mm-hmm. So back on the command carrier, Braca is reporting that uh, Leviathans are decelerating. 
Uh, and Scorpius's thought there is either they have no plan or they're about to enact a plan that I don't understand yet. Either way, let's shoot guns at them right now. <laughs> yeah. And so, yes, everyone's running to command now because Pilot has detected the command carrier is approaching. And so Talon also sees the command carrier and one of his guns starts like coming out and Rigel's like, oh, hell yeah, the baby's got guns. Have him shoot that gun at the guys we don't like. And then Talon shoots them instead. (laughs) This is a hell of a time for some childhood rebellion. Talon, you got, oh boy, can you pick him? Mm -hmm. So yeah, he he shoots Moya and is because he's very scared and doesn't know what to do but the, the, the command carrier that's showing up. And he's basically demanding that someone tell him what to do. And then John makes a reference to the Menendez trial, which I yes. did not. Re- oh, my God. Yes. This has got to be the worst aged thing in the entire show. When he said that, I was like, what the fuck is the Menendez <laughs> what the brothers? Fuck? What is this? And so, yeah, I had to look it up. It was like, oh, I oh. barely remember this happening. <laughs> especially with the further information that's come to light since uh, that did not get enough attention during the actual trial. Oh, John, John, mm, John. I don't know about that stuff, actually. Oh, boy. But but yeah, Talon's message is basically, hey, they are shooting at me, so I would like the war man, please. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the war man is who I need uh, uh, aboard me right now, please, today. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Talon is unwilling to discuss anything further. Moya believes he won't shoot again. <laughs> which, mm. Mm. And so uh, John has Pilot put up that defense screen, which, you know, still works, but has a bunch of holes in it. Uh, so Talon fires a shot and completely annihilates their shield. <laughs> Yes. One shot just completely destroys it. The, the shield is gone. The the shield's like control deck aboard just ex- is ruined in in the shower of detritus. Yep. Uh, Jelena is well and truly dead now. <laughs> yep. Yep. And yeah, they they've got a ticking clock because Scorpius is going to show up in like five thousand microts or whatever. And so we we have a brief cut to commercial and come back still in the middle of the action. And Aaron decides to form the most fucked up family in space yep. to prevent utter disaster. <laughs> yep, she is going to bring Craze onto Talon but and she stay is... with them as like yeah. a mitigating effect. Look, the dad's abusive. I'm going to be there to make the abuse slightly less bad. <laughs> Anyone who's heard this plan in real life will tell you it does not work that way, Aaron. Nope. No. Anyway, they could have this conversation a little faster. Time is ticking. There's a lot of pauses. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Especially when they go down to Crace in his cell, and he is reveling in it. Oh, yeah. The instant the door's open, he has, like, the biggest shit-eating grin on his face. Because he's just like, oh, yeah, the, the boy wants me. I knew he would want me eventually. The boy loves me. <laughs> I'm the real dad. <laughs> Should also mention that in in this episode, Crace's hair has gone back to being like, you know, very slicked back and, and tightly pulled back. He mm-hmm. is no longer in his disheveled, I'm hunting for John Crichton and going insane mode anymore. Whereas Aaron's hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she, yeah. That's what's going on yeah. with her now. Yeah, Crace very, like, smug and, and self-satisfied right now. Like, John turns to him and just says, like, hey, if you hurt either Talon or Aaron, I'm going to hunt you down. And Crace is just like, oh, you're going to hunt me down. That's very funny. <laughs> and he's not intimidated whatsoever. Quote, that would complete the symmetry nicely. I, I can hear you, Ricky <laughs> Manning. I hear you uh-huh. in there. Quiet, quiet down. Quiet. D- did David Kemper make you say that? Come on. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> you don't have to say it. It's already there, very obvious. And so, yeah, every, John, Aaron, and Crace are walking back to the Prowler. And before they go, John tells Aaron, like, hey, the last time I left and I thought I was going to die, uh, we didn't say goodbye. You know, and it wasn't a goodbye, it turns out. Uh, so I'm not going to do it here either. They've never said goodbye ever. Yep. Yeah. They 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 hold hands for a moment. Just looking into each other, in, in into each each other's eyes before, you know, Aaron leaves with Grace. <laughs> Grace gets this really funny look at them holding hands. Yeah, yeah. What are you doing? What is that? <laughs> Y'all getting a load of this? There's there's no one for me to ask this rhetorical question to. Who am I looking at? Uh, all right. 
yes, our, our two ex peacekeepers fly off in, in a prowler, arrive on Talon, where Talon extends the highest honor that can be bestowed oh my God. by the thing that Talon is the only one of. <laughs> The hand of friendship. <laughs> the hand of friendship. <laughs> it's a so yes, the the very center of the floor opens up and a, a creepy little like doc ock arm <laughs> slides mm-hmm. out of it. He's taken aback. This is this is like a yeah. big moment for him. He's he, genuinely thankful. He also looks terrified though. Yeah. Because <laughs> Hell yeah. This great honor is this metal metal tentacle comes out. And has a giant computer chip with spikes coming out of it like it's a little, like, evil spider. And it just slams it into the back of his neck. <laughs> and, and Did you notice the hand of I the did. hand of friendship? I, okay. did, I did notice a human hand holding the, the little tentacle <laughs> coming out of the floor. It's very obvious. <laughs> and, like, the way the tentacle is moving, it's very clearly, like, being held by a human hand just in the way it moves because you can tell all of its weight is being supported at the very bottom. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's very funny. But, but yeah, this, like, eight-pointed uh, uh, claw just, like, jabs into the back of his neck. There's a lot of blood mm-hmm. uh, leaking from every point of, of this connection. So, yeah... Talon, as uh, uh, this this peacekeeper gunship hybrid Leviathan, is designed to work without a pilot. Mm-hmm. But you can be made into something like a pilot. <laughs> yeah, th- this thing that is attached to the back of Grace's neck essentially lets him become like like share his mind with with Talons. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. And now it's not just you're not just commanding the ship you can also just kind of be the ship sort of like you're way more in sync. Yeah. The, the, the communication is much more immediate. He can mm. sense what Talon senses out in space. All, all these things. He basically is kind of, kind of a pilot and Aaron's like, wait a minute. I thought we were going to co-parent this baby. And uh, it turns out that the, the thing built to, to be this uh, military warship isn't really designed for cooperative leadership. Mm-hmm. Weird. Weird. Mm. So they have a big fist fight. <laughs> yep. They they just start beating the shit out of each other. Uh Talon is in the mix too because he's the 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 knife guns come out of the ceiling just start shooting everywhere. This is a pretty fun fight. I think they're they're both I think both of these actors are really good at selling. Oh yeah. Uh, which is what really makes it. And yeah, the the extra like heightening effect of the, those knife guns hemming them in to to space it's it's good it's fun yep and the fight kind of ends with aaron losing here because mm-hmm. she's like Crace gets up she's being uh held at gunpoint by by talon you know she's trying to tell talon that she's not the enemy to which so Crace is immediately starting to talk in wheeze now <laughs> Yes. And he says, oh, we know you're not the enemy, but also you have 50 seconds to get on your prowler uh, before we just vent you into space. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so she is forced to basically just crawl back into her ship. Uh, at the same time, they have uh, uh, Moya has about 90 seconds before she's in firing range of the, the command carrier. Uh, this is when they, they pick up Aaron alone in her prowler coming back. She, she comes in, uh, really cutting it down to the wire. We're just cutting between the, the three bridges, basically, of these three mm-hmm. ships as as everyone prepares for the shooting war. And then Crace is like, hey, Scorpius, ring-a-ding-ding, I got something to tell you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Crace is basically, like, gloating a little bit mm-hmm. and also tells Scorpius, like, hey, uh, I killed John Crichton. He's dead. I, I killed the hell out of him. With his bare hands, he says. Yep. He basically says... Hey, so this is my final report, uh, and fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and then he starbursts away the impossible thing. Yep. Uh, so, of course, without Talon to, to keep her there, Moya also jumps for her own safety mm-hmm. and leaves Scorpius and his command carrier shooting at nothing. He's very upset. He's yep. very upset at the Leviathan expert who told him that uh, uh, Talon wouldn't be uh, strong enough to, to do a starburst for another hour. Mm-hmm. Dude, it's been days and days. Yeah. 
I think a one hour margin of error is still fantastically accurate uh, uh, forecasting. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, Scorpius, you know, telling Bracca like, oh, so that guy was wrong uh, just just barely. Can you bring him to me so I can basically uh, cut his head off? (laughs) He says educate. Educate. The verb he uses is educate. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And so he also commands Bracca, like, hey, start searching for Moya on the most, like, probable areas they may have starbursted to. And Bracca's just like, but but Kreis said he killed him. John is dead. And <laughs> Scorpius is like, well, fucking of course he's not dead. <laughs> Kreis did that because he sucks and hates me. If Kreis actually killed him, he wouldn't tell me because he hates me. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, he just sits and makes this horribly evil pose in his chair in profile. It's Mm -hmm. very cool. Uh, so we go to the final commercial and come back for our, our epilogue act five, where it's Dargo's turn to fucking talk to Zan in, in the zonk zone. (laughs) The, The thing he says when he first shows up is if you're going to sit there in a coma, you could at least smile. Jeez. Jesus, dude. Uh, and she calls him Sweet Dargo in the way she always does. Mm-hmm. Aww. And yeah, she's just like sitting at a table. Um, you know, she's got a whole bunch of random you know, jewels and crystals all over it. And Dargo's asking her, oh, is this another part of the Seek? And she goes, no, I'm I'm actually like mentally here now. Aaron was right. I was being kind of shitty. <laughs> I I really appreciate Dargo's point that like the the higher levels of existence will always be there. We've only got this one right now. Mm-hmm. Like, damn, dude, damn. Whoa. So in Pilot's Den, John Crichton is idly tussling Aaron Soon's <laughs> hair for yep. some reason. Yep. Yeah. Aaron's very upset that Talon is gone. She feels like she you know really failed him. As they snuggle, as they canoodle, mm-hmm. and make Pilot watch. Yep. And Pilot says that uh, Talon told Moya that he was choosing Crace of his own volition. And uh, Pilot says, for what it's worth, Talon will mail, ba- mail home every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> they they talk about Talon as a baby a couple days ago in story, and now he's a teenager. Yep. Just immediately. Aaron's just wondering out loud if Talon's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And and John comes in the, with the, the wisdom of sounding like he's been a parent before. <laughs> like, oh, he's young. He's going to make mistakes, but he'll learn. Mm-hmm. If Crace ever miss, you know, if Crace is ever shitty to Talon, Talon will know to kick him out. The, the last moment is just like Aaron being held in John's arms as they all just sort of muse on the ambiguity of Crace. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> basically talking about like hey do you think people can change and like well you changed Aaron but I don't know if Crace is capable of that <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah that's the that's the end of the episode which takes us to episode two of season two Vetus Mortis written by Grant McAloon script editor and previous writer of Durka Returns and directed by once again Tony Tils uh, who directed the season one finale Family Ties mm-hmm and this opens with Dargo, John, and Zan walking into a Monty Python cartoon segment. So I <laughs> had a different thought as to what this map painting is. This looks like the start of every Aqua Teen Hunger Force episode for like the first two or three seasons where it's <laughs> Dr. Weird's lab and the South Jersey Shore. It looks, mm-hmm. it fucking looks like that to me. But this is the first time really that We've had characters walk into uh, a, a matte painting uh, exterior establishing shot. Yeah, They've yeah. Always been separate before. Now we're integrating, and there's a, a a very conspicuous effect shot later in this episode. That's like, okay, all right. Animal logic is is trying to flex here. They they want us to know they got the contract and they're going to do something with it. Okay, mm. all right. So yes, John, Dargo, and Zan, uh, they all got new outfits. Yeah. And as we'll see later, Aaron also has a new outfit, I believe. Dargo's is more of a, a new cloak over his old outfit, but yeah. Zan is a, a whole new take on her her classic blue robes with decorated neck. I like this one a lot. Yeah, yeah. You, you like the uh, gold collar plate yeah, wrapped yeah. around her shoulders? Yeah. I think it's neat. With inset gems and jewels? Yeah. 
And she's also got like fucking gauntlets on, man. Hell yeah. <laughs> Golden gauntlets. Meanwhile, John is in a like is in like a black all leather outfit, like Hell trench coat. Yes. Looking Hell like he's from yes. the, looking like he's fucking Neo from the Matrix. He's, he's a future cowboy. Like like the um the peacekeeper captain outfit he wore several episodes ago. It's also got like the buckles down the middle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And when he takes it off, he's rocking a level a, a leather vest with the same buckles. Mm-hmm. It, it looks like maybe he just modified the the Lorac jacket into a vest. Maybe, yeah. But I I think it's a new piece that we're supposed to think might be a recycled piece. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, that vest is like the John Crichton look, right? It, it's not all he's going to wear from here on out. But if you look at, but it is his, his signature costume. Yeah, yeah. And so, yes, yeah, so the, th- the three of them walk into this this big, ominous-looking castle <laughs> in the mm-hmm, matte painting. Mm-hmm. And they are following rumors, rumors of a Luxon living in this temple that they picked up at a, a commerce planet. Mm-hmm. Every This is like the third or fourth time they have mentioned a commerce planet. I love that there are multiple planets that are just shopping malls. <laughs> <laughs> That's their singular purpose. Every time I'm I'm like doing a road trip, I'm I'm not pulling off to a, a do a Culver's drive through and gas up. No, I'm going to a, a commerce exit. <laughs> yeah. So yes, the three of them enter this temple and they're greeted by a a woman in a hood that you don't see much of this episode. Do you ever see her? I think again? this is I think this is the only time you see her actually. But she's got kind of like a, a reddish purplish face with like scales. Oh, it's a little ominous in here. It's a little tense. She just runs away without a word. Yep. She like go, you know, runs away like through a big pair set of double doors. Dargo's looking at this big lamp with like a torch and seems to be in awe <laughs> of it because it's a, it's an old tech lamp. It's a Luxon lamp that wards off evil. Mm-hmm. Yes, this this hooded lady comes back. And beckons them all to come Just, in. And then scampers away forever. <laughs> yeah. And this room they enter into it are like the, the bedroom chambers of an old Luxon woman named Neelam. Neelam here is played by Melissa Jaffer, most recognizable, I, I would imagine, as the Keeper of the Seeds in Mad Max Fury Road. Oh. Yeah. Cool. She's more recently uh, one of the racist neighbors in the last act of 3,000 Years of Longing. <laughs> Great. BS. Yes, this this old woman, this old Luxon. Ancient old crone, bedridden. Yeah. Like, identifies, okay, there's a Delvian here, there's a Luxon here, and someone else I cannot identify. And John's like, yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. But she asks for Dargo to come closer. So he, he slowly approaches her. Uh, introduces himself as Cod Argo. And she says, ah, yes, General Dargo. Mm-hmm. To which John's just like, huh? What? Uh, and like whispers to Zan, like, must be losing your eyesight. To which she's like, yeah, I am losing my eyesight, but I can hear shit really good, so sh- shut up. <laughs> uh, it's so weird to see everything that goes on a Luxon head on this tiny lady body. Yes. I'm afraid her neck is going to snap. Yeah, it's... I feel like all Luxons should have large builds so their giant heads make sense. <laughs> uh, I mean, she is old, so maybe maybe she's shrinking right, down. Right. I don't know. That's why she just lays in bed all day. She can't support all that. I mean, this is the first actual other Luxon we've seen, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I've always been curious, hey, do Luxons... I, I guess we've seen Jothy, but that's in like holograms. But mm-hmm. um, I have always been curious... Hey, do any Luxons like take their head tentacles and do them up like hairdos? And the answer is yes. This this yeah. <laughs> Nilam does that. Mm-hmm. But she she's here uh, alone, like spent years and years on this planet. Mm-hmm. She's dying, and she is an Orican. This this is a holy woman. This is like the priestly order of the Luxons, mm-hmm. and she needs someone to attend her in death. And is willing to test Dargo to see if he is worthy, if he's capable of this honor. Yeah. What is the matter of this test? So she slowly raises one of her old, you know, like quivering, shaking hands, just fing- fingers just completely straight out. And her hand gets near Dargo's chest and it begins, her hand begins to glow. And it's like, okay, she's like, 
feeling his energies or or something like that or she's going to do some kind of holy like blessing upon him or something and then she jams her whole hand down like into his chest yes <laughs> she jams her whole hand in there starts rooting around he starts convulsing and and, and like growling in pain and uh, uh, then he is suddenly thrown bodily out the room, flying backward. Yeah. And like, she screams, fraud! Yeah, he gets thrown like fucking 40 feet back or something. And that's the end of the cold open. <laughs> so everyone is is checking on Dargo, see if he's okay. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just, it was just shocking. And I'm with John this whole episode. Fucking leave. <laughs> this sucks, leave. I can immediately tell something bad is going on here. Mm-hmm. One, she just had her whole hand in your guts. <laughs> yeah, like he's really concerned for Dargo. First, physically at this like uh, apparent like at this like violation of his body mm-hmm. that leaves no wound, of course, because it's it's mystic magic shit. Uh, but then at the insult that oh wait, my boy's not good enough to watch you die. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Zan, being you know a different kind of of holy person is a little more on Neelam's side and like, okay, she she does not mean to harm him. This is this is all holy priestly shit. You do not understand, John. She is an Orican. This is a holy woman that must is to be revered. And John's immediately yeah, but what suspicious. What if she's a fake? What what if she Yeah. Like, yeah. What if she's been defrocked and that's why she's alone here in the uncharted territories. You don't know. Yeah. Look at the fucking evil ass looking castle she's in. <laughs> He's just so offended on Dargo's behalf. It's mm-hmm. so sweet. Dargo want, wants to stay or or rather is is on Neelam's side like, you know, it's she did not think she did nothing wrong. It's true that I am not worthy. She called me a fraud because I am not a general and John's like, "Who fucking said you were?" <laughs> and and Dargo is the one to say, "Okay, it's me. I said I said I was a general." And it's because of these the the chan the the tattoos on my little chin tentacle I've had the whole show. Mm-hmm, those are the mm-hmm. markings of a general, uh, and the reason why he has those markings is because in that uh, in Dargo's second campaign, uh, he and and the rest of the the soldiers were surrounded by the enemy. The general uh, was badly wounded, would not survive inter- interrogation if captured, and so Dargo took on the general chin uh, chin tattoo to essentially act as a decoy to save the general yeah yeah he has <laughs> body double stolen valor yep. uh basically <laughs> so following this explanation uh zan's like hey buddy that's rough you did your best i think you're worthy and uh john is gassing him up too dargo takes a moment it's like yeah i kind of own i'm gonna give this old lady a piece of my mind and walks right back in there (laughs) yeah yeah it's really funny how he's like reveres her so much and then he's just like wait a minute fuck her hey (laughs) hey so tell me what the hell is she bitching about i agree with Crichton. your fraud served a higher purpose dargo certainly the oricon can understand that and if she doesn't brother that's her problem you're right. Good. So let's get back to Moya and heat up some Irish coffees. No. You're right that she should understand that. Wait here. Damn. We we're almost out of here. So he walks in and is like, she's all like, who dares? And like, I dare. Let me tell you some things, lady. Uh, and basically she likes his moxie. <laughs> yeah, that's enough to convince her. Meanwhile, on Moya... Chiana is doing the laundry. Doing the laundry on Moya is funny. (laughs) Describe to me the laundry chamber. So the laundry chamber has a like kiddie pool sized zone that is that has a big like organic pipe or like Mm -hmm. laundry machine tube (laughs) descending (laughs) on it. That is just kind of belching like dry ice (laughs) out onto everything. And there's some sort of goo and and like yeah. masses or pods or i don't know if they have just that many clothes that that are making the like i don't know it it, it looks like slime grits mm-hmm. yeah and chiana's just like knee deep in it basically yeah <laughs> knee deep in the slime grits 
and Aaron comes in asking like, hey, can you clean my shit up, my shit too? You know, and Shiana responds back like, hey, I'm not your servant. Why are you cleaning Dargo stuff? And her answer is because I like Dargo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it's even named. The, the stuff in in the, uh, the the laundry chamber is Moya's Amnexus Fluids. Oh, Gross. I don't I don't know what that is, but it it sounds like a fresh spring breeze. Mm-hmm. So it's it's back on the planet. Uh, Dargo has has been accepted to to be her attendant in uh, uh, the ritual of passing, which is a thing Zan knows all about. I, I guess these priestly orders are always like going to conferences, exchanging pamphlets. She she's up to date. Mm-hmm. John is asking Dargo, okay, wh- what exactly do you have to do in in this ritual? First up, anything she says. <laughs> yeah, anything she says, anything she says to comfort her and ease her pain in in passing. John is, every time they say something about, like, how the ritual works, he goes, okay, like, strike one, strike two. This sounds too dicey. Because, like, the second thing is, oh, uh, part of the ritual... Re- uh, involves a transference of dargo's life energy and he's just like "Mm, no (laughs) it's only a little risky (laughs) it's the highest honor a luxon knows to to assist an orican in her passing yeah and zan's trying to reassure john like there is very little risk involved and john hears little risk and goes okay so there is some risk what's the worst thing that can happen Oh, and you Dargo, know, dying. Yeah, just dying. Dargo, yeah, Dargo's just like, oh, I could die. <laughs> and again, I am with John this entire episode. This sounds stupid and sucks. Let's leave. <laughs> but but if you uh, uh, help her pass over, you get a glimpse of the other side, and then you return. Probably, you probably return. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Dargo stresses that like it's his choice to make, and he's going to do it. Mm-hmm. But first, they got to make a quick stop back on Moya. Uh, or rather, Zan and Dargo do. John decides to stay behind so he can talk to Neelam. Yeah, he's he's got some grievances to air. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, he's telling Neelam, like, hey, I'm worried about the well-being of Dargo. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't want him to die. Can you tell him to not do this and leave him alone? Uh, and she says that, is is telling Dargo that, hey, his fate is out of your control. It's, it's up to him. And John comes back with okay cool it's not in my control it's extremely in your control though (laughs) you could just tell him that he doesn't have to do this and she's asking him like oh are you scared of the spiritual realm and john's answer is i'm scared of my friends being dead (laughs) yeah he's like laughing at her and all this because like he's expecting the response of like her comforting him and saying like oh you know do not worry my child and all this stuff but she goes no dargo dargo could die <laughs> he yeah, could die during this. i mean i'm i'm gonna try to make sure he doesn't but you know nothing's perfect and so he just sits down on the bed next to her and asks yeah okay the ritual passing is it really that important couldn't you just die like a normal person <laughs> <laughs> and her answer is i could but i don't want to <laughs> She she engages the uh, appeal to loneliness, which is one of the lesser known logical fallacies. Mm-hmm. She tells John it's been like nine years since she's seen any other Luxons, and she's too weak to make the travel back home. This is basically her only opportunity. And hey, John, do you have do you know what it's like to be separated from your kind? And like, okay, you got me there. Mm-hmm, you can't, mm-hmm. begr- you, you know, this is my my final wish. Please let me have it. And that's enough to convince John. And hey, since we got another uh, person of the main cast who may be dying soon, uh, Rigel slides in, all happy that maybe he can have some shit. <laughs> He's also considering maybe this old lady's got some money. <laughs> yeah. And so Chiana comes in and just like grabs Rigel by the mouth, basically, to, to shut him up. Because she's worried about her friend Dargo. Mm-hmm. That's her laundry pal, dang it. So yeah, Dargo leaves and tells Chiana, like, hey, make sure Rigel doesn't eat my share of the food. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Rigel says, like, yeah, okay, I heard that, but I don't believe that. <laughs> I think you're dying. <laughs> I don't think you believe you're coming back. So back in the temple, Dargo is in the chamber, and John is just in the waiting room. 
uh, while while he's preparing to begin the ritual. Mm-hmm. Dargo's in his like ritual garb, which I like the look of. Yeah, he, tell me about this garb. So it's it's kind of like a a thin like like magenta robe or or maybe not full on robe. The thing is though, it looks really comfy and it's got <laughs> like kind of a like golden piping in a, in a like you know repeating square pattern uh, mm-hmm, over the mm-hmm. whole thing. But it kind of looks like something you'd wear after getting like a like. It looks like something you'd wear at the spa or something. Like this yeah, looks like, yeah, the, this looks like vacation Dargo to me. And uh, Nilam is wearing a, a, a matching robe herself, but mm. underneath a, a padded uh, corset, much much like what's her name from? <laughs> oh uh, yeah, yeah. Back and back and back to the future. Yep. It's just a thing among the tentacled peoples, I, I guess. guess. So they begin the ritual, which is. All sorts of magical chanting. Oh yeah, naturally. lots of magical chanting. But they take Dargo's Qualta blade, they stab it in in between them, and they both cut their their palms on it and then join mm-hmm. hands, so the blood is like mixing. And then um, the sword starts to fly. Hell yeah! Hell it, yeah! It, it just floats, and it's like floating right above them, almost in a way where it looks like it's just gonna cleave one of them in two. And you see a shot of John here hearing the chanting and stuff, but like he doesn't know what else is going on. And he just gets up and throws his hands up in the air and spins around like, oh, fuck this. I, I hate what I'm hearing. <laughs> it's it's all he can do to not just like kick down that door and interrupt. You, you got to trust your pal. You got to let him do his thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Dargo howls in pain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's when John rushes in as the Qualta blade falls. Yep. Uh, and as John runs in there, he pulls his gun out and just points uh-huh. it at Nilam. He's living his cowboy dreams, pulling a, his little pistol out from a holster mm-hmm. underneath that space duster. Hell yeah. But as he points his pistol at Nilam, she holds one of her hands out and uh, causes John to drop his gun because it becomes superheated. And there's like mm-hmm. smoke coming out of his glove. We see that uh, the the slice on Dargo's palm, his blood is running clear. Ah, mm-hmm. uh, ah, uh, but he's dazed. You see Nilam get up, and this whole time she's been facing away from everyone, and she turns around, and she's young now. She's young again. Ah, she is now played by Annalise Phillips, uh, who would appear in the first four episodes of the NBC series Revolution, mm. dying before she could hick up, hook up with Billy Burke. <laughs> also dying many episodes before Rockney S. O'Bannon joined the writing uh, mm. crew. <laughs> he, he came on in the second season. Uh, but back up on Moya, the laundry goo has turned solid. Yes, Chiana is, is stuck in, in the, the laundry machine, uh, the washing <laughs> machine. With her ass out, like like many porns have started. She's trapped up to the knees. Yep. Yeah. And so Aaron comes in, and she just thinks this is very funny. Mm-hmm. She's very amused that Shiana is stuck in the goo. What have you done? Nothing. Well, you must have done something. I didn't do anything. It just froze up all around me. Get me out of here. When did I become your servant? Don't frill around. Just, just get me out of here, okay? You know. What's the hurry, Chiana? You're not allergic to Moya's amnexus fluids, are you? Oh, yeah, very funny, Aaron. Look, can you please just do something? Sick. Finally, someone who's a little more useful. What did she do? Oh, I didn't do anything. Just... Aaron, come on. Come on this don't is be dangerous. A don't, don't be a dick. But yeah, Zan comes in, too, to check everything out. She, she asks for Pilot's thoughts on things. And Pilot doesn't entirely know what's going on, other than, like, one of her various systems it has begun to fail on multiple turns Nilam is kind of just like admiring being young again yes like yes playing with her hair just like sighing <laughs> john asking dargo if he's okay to which Nilam says he's more than okay and this is the point in the episode he's where i went so strong <laughs> this is the instant this happened this is the point of the episode where i thought oh no <laughs> <laughs> oh no because we know that Ka Dargo has a serious weakness for women with tentacles. Yeah. 
I was just like, I I don't want this to happen again. Like the the actress playing Neelam is certainly better than the previous lady, mm-hmm. and is not nearly as hammy. But it's still just like, oh man. Did you have that thought before or after the nipple licking? Before. <laughs> So th- this is uh, th- there's this episode has too much of seeing basically what Dargo's O face is. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> and yeah, she just starts sucking on his his space nipples, <laughs> and like John is still there for the start of this, and there's he a, excuses himself rather quickly. There's a part where he just makes he just scrunches his whole face up because he's so disgusted. And yeah, he just leaves. <laughs> well, Dargo gets licked a lot, a lot, a lot, and she and Neelam's like, just like, oh my god, I can taste you, and Dargo just like shakes his head, like, yeah. <laughs> and Neelam steps back to to the bed that she was confined to in her age, and now is returning to uh, uh, recreationally as yep. a wind machine buffets <laughs> her. So. Part that and I don't like is this. turning into the 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 big bad wolf from Looney Tunes. Yes, yes, he he's going awuga, and his eyeballs are <laughs> shooting out of his head, and his tongue is rolling down onto the floor. <laughs> all that shit. The le- my least favorite thing that ever happens to Dargo is this stuff. I hate seeing it. It's just bad. Uh, <laughs> it's it, it's it, it's a similar feeling to me as t- to. Like when you become the age where you realize that your parents have sex and you're just like, <laughs> uh, I, I wonder how much of just this scene alone would have been improved if it was later in the season, if he was more used to the new prosthetics. Cause I feel oh, like sure. some of the choices he's making are based in the habit of how the previous yeah. ones yeah, the face moved are- and, and could act. Part of yeah. it certainly is because the faces are very exaggerated and cartoony. He's going so hard. Yeah. Uh, another part of the reason why this doesn't work for me is because, you know, there's only been two other Luxons in the show so far. I or feel, Luxon cousins, even. Not even Luxons. Yeah, yeah. I feel like they have not figured out how to make the Luxon head look good on anyone but Dargo's actor. <laughs> Because he so true. he has a big frame and yes. like that head works on him. But and they embiggen him so much. Like underneath yeah. the the cranium, he's wearing a like Anthony Simcoe is wearing a helmet under that makeup yeah. to make the head bigger. There's there's all the muscle padding. There is oh my god, there's an incredible bit in one of the behind the scenes documentaries where you see them taking a full body cast of him and he's just locked in plaster. Oh suspended. god. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and then they cut. Co- the, the bit that they film is just them covering his face, just slamming this pink sludge on him to oh, take the that's face incredible. while he's in, like, neck down plaster already. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the makeup just doesn't work for anyone else yet. They all look like bobbleheads. And mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. it makes it hard for me to believe that Darga would look at this lady and go, ooh, this lady's hot. Because she looks <laughs> bizarre. She is this tiny, skinny, frail-looking lady with a gigantic fucking head. <laughs> and it doesn't work for me. Oh, but boy, is it working for Dargo. It sure is. Uh, yeah, yeah. And just to underline it, they the cut from this is immediately to a pole being repeatedly slammed into a pool of fluids. Yep. Very subtle, very clever. <laughs> and hey, the pole's actually the space ore. It's the space Space or I'm so happy the space. Returns. I'm so happy the space or returns. Uh, that should be the sequel, Space or Returns. Yeah. So yeah, the space or having no effect on the the solidified goo. Zan is in a di- in her science zone, like trying to make compounds to dissolve little scrapings she got. From That's the goo. not working. The no. DRD laser is not cutting Chiana free. Pilot. Uh, relays that some portions of Moya's outer skin are beginning to deteriorate. That's not good. That sounds bad if her, that somebody's sounds really bad. If anyone's skin is deteriorating, go to the hospital. Uh, <laughs> I don't think there's a bed big enough for Moya. Yeah, yeah. 
like it's it's all hands on deck. They're radioing down to to John, and he fucking maintains bro code. <laughs> He's not yes. interrupting anything. <laughs> like you hear the, all the fucking like grunts and the slamming <laughs> sounds from the th- muffled coming through the door. And I thought that would be it, but no. The camera passes through the door, and we just mm-hmm. see Dargo Neelam in bed with her asking, "Like, have I finally sapped your strength?" And then Dargo just goes, "Only temporarily. Give me thirty minutes." <laughs> God, I need a ritual of renewal myself. <laughs> <laughs> I've hardly oh. been able to leave this bed for six cycles, but now I don't want to leave it. <laughs> So, so yeah, uh, she can, with her incredible Orican powers, make all of Dargo's dreams come true. And also the rest of the crew. Once they finally take a break for like a glass of water, maybe order in a pizza, something. Yeah. Oh, God. I just remember. You got to top up your electrolytes after all this. Yeah. I just remember the comment Dargo makes too, which is I made an oath I would never again be held prisoner. So much for that. <laughs> and I'm just like, <laughs> bleh. Oh, God. This is a private moment. I don't want to he- see or hear any of this. <laughs> uh, but yeah, she, she, uh, they, they are clearly having a great time together and like, yeah, I, I have holy magic. I can find your kid. I can, I can find Delvia. Yeah, it's cool. Mm-hmm. And so Dargo goes, my son. I want to see my son again. That's yep. what I want to see. Yep, yep, That's yep, what I yep. want you to do for me. I don't know where he is, but help me find my son. In like 45 minutes, maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so back up on Moya, there is a Moya quake. <laughs> yeah. All, all of Zan's random jars and potions are shaking. One of them just looks like a big old bottle of piss. I don't know. <laughs> With noodles in it? <laughs> yeah, there's noodles in it. <laughs> it, it, it it's, it's special... Like herbs or, or or medicinal noodles that are kept in piss, and that's how they stay fresh. When uh, you're here, you're family. <laughs> but the shaken is from a hull breach. Oh no, uh, Jesus! And so John's here but- now, also trying to help with the solidified goo. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's also thinking, "Wow, we should patent this stuff." <laughs> uh, th- they are saved from disaster because, of course, Moya as a sp- Base worthy vessel is double hulled. the The outer skin breach is not v- decompressing anything because of the inner hull. Yeah. Whew. So in comes Rigel in his, one of his little nighttime robes. Rigel looks different in this scene because, like, all of his hair is smoothed down more than it usually is. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. This is they, they redid the Rigel puppet. That's what I uh, thought. In between seasons, um, John Eccleston. The the uh, prime puppeteer of Rigel moved back to England after the first season. With him went the the knowledge and the mastery of the uh, cable control of Rigel's lips. Mm. If if you watch like season one behind the scenes stuff, you'll see John Eccleston sitting on the floor, one hand in Rigel, one hand uh, working a joystick, and how he moves that joystick moves uh, the cable that rings Rigel's mouth to, to make uh, vowel shapes and smiles and things. Okay. Rigel, from here on out, though those uh, mouth movements, along with the rest of his face, are controlled by little motors mm-hmm. that are programmed to, to make less robotic motions, but are essentially on-off middle type stuff. Yeah, yeah. So he also moves a little differently and, yeah, has, has reconstructed to fit this different works inside the, the skin. Yeah, yeah, I, I did think the puppet seemed different, especially, like, when I was, like, in the scene when he's talking, it really felt like I was seeing different, more elaborate movements from his face than before. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, Chian is freaked out right now. She can't feel her feet anymore. <laughs> yeah. Aaron has left to go get grenades, which scares her. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a funny reaction to that. But Rigel, yeah, is coming in and he's just like, hey, don't worry that much. A lo- like, hole breaches on Leviathans almost never happen. And at that instant, a hole breach happens. Yes. In the room they are currently in, and the it's a small hole, but the vacuum starts sucking stuff up, including Rigel, who goes flying 
and he plugs the hole with his ass. Yes. Yes. <laughs> But before that, before that, we follow a wrench yes. out the hole in this wall, through uh, the passageways, through the inner hull, through the outer hull, out into space, through through all of the, the systems and structures of Moya. Yeah. When I s- this aired a year before similar shots in Panic Room, yep. in The Fast and the Furious, even before the Josie and the Pussycats movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, when I when I saw that that VFX shot, I went whoa because I one it looks pretty good still, and also like I remember you know hearing that there's a new VFX team for for this season. I was just like, okay, that's that is them absolutely flexing because that's yeah pretty impressive for a TV show of this era. It it really feels like they are announcing themselves uh, mm-hmm. uh, in, in this moment. We love the old effects house, especially when it came to particle animation. They did some really cool looking particle stuff. Mm -hmm. They never tried. um, Maybe they were never asked to try, but they never tried to do anything like this wrench bit. Mm -hmm. The the hole is plugged for now by Rigel, who is his big old booty. He's very uncomfortable. You can see the puppet is moving in a way that you can tell he's kind of being pulled by the vacuum of space still. He is filling space with helium right now you can tell you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) um there's a funny yeah exterior shot of moya where you see his butt and his little feet dangling out of the ship yeah it's pretty good yeah erin comes back in because she was she was out uh on the the outside of the ship checking out what was going on and then she just in her hand shows that she has a little chunk of moya's hole like hey this just came off like really easy like, I was able just to pull this right off Moya on my own. Uh, Rigel is worried if uh, this whole thing has ripped his, his little frog cloaca out. And uh, <laughs> Aaron has has no news to share. She did not check it out. Yep. So Dargo and Neelam are here now. Mm-hmm. Um, and Neelam thinks that she may be able to, you know, do something here to help fix Moya. Of course. Um, She's an Oricant, not an Oricant. Mm-hmm. Chiana is uh like f- still freaked out and like at John is going like I thought you said said that she was ancient and John is just like mouthing like I'll tell you later. <laughs> uh so so she steps forward and places a hand uh uh on the the wall near Rigel and starts to to mutter a healing incantation but it only makes things worse. There's another Moya quake even more severe than before. Yeah. So Neelam says that, you know, she's got to go meditate. She has to find, there must be some way for her to help Moya. She just has to to figure it out. And Dargo is the first to piece together the timeline. Things mm-hmm. started going bad here when you drew a lot of energy. Wait a minute. Mm. Uh. So yeah, he's confronting Neelam about that. She she figures out that this incredible wellspring of, of strength she found and decided in the moment to, instead of dying, I'll do the make myself young again spell, Yeah, yeah. Uh, was not truly Dargo's to give. She was feeling Moya through him. Mm-hmm. And that's what she stole. And that's why Moya is, is suddenly aged near death the way she was yep. uh, not too long ago. And so she decides that she wants to go back down to the planet. Uh, to her mm-hmm. chambers to like look through manuscripts and the potions and all this She's other shit. She's got to check the scrolls. The scrolls, the Tevek scrolls, because um, maybe she'll find a solution there. And this is the point where you get to see, you know, what does Dargo actually value more? Uh, mm-hmm. And he tells her that he cannot abandon Moya. He will not go with her. Neelam is like going stating like okay but i still have to leave because i am really bad for this ship check this out and she just touches a part of the wall and it just starts to like disintegrate uh but you know what aaron doesn't value at all knowing things (laughs) yeah 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 so she and, and Zan are also talking about how weird, how these things sort of happen at the same time. Wait a minute. She's leaving. She's trying to get away with it. I must shoot her now. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> it's it. It escalates very quickly here. She goes to visit Pilot and he's extremely frail and like shaking and barely he, he's having difficulty speaking even. 
all these fibers are sticking out of him. Yeah, but he has her locate Dargo and Neelam. They're in the transport hangar. And so, yeah, she she's going to go kill Neelam, and she doesn't have, like, her pistol. She has the big-ass hip-mounted gun. <laughs> On the assumption that this is an escape and not going to get my scrolls to find a, 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 a better spell. Mm-hmm. And so she just barges in. John is right behind her trying to convince her to not shoot. She does not listen, and she fucking <laughs> just almost point blank tries to blast Neelam. And so we get this... When Ka Dargo runs at light speed. <laughs> yeah, it, at light speed in slow motion. Yeah. Going like, no. <laughs> how how does he cover the distance to get it's in incredible. front of this laser bolt in motion? It's incredible. He's too far away. <laughs> He's uh, so fast. He's so strong. So yes, he, he gets in the way of Neelam. But the the like plasma shot from this gun gets split in two and curves around him and Neelam due to because of her Neelam magic. Yeah, her eyes like turn red and, and all that. But it's not just that; she also casts a an ice spell <laughs> on John and Aaron, and so they are trapped in big ice crystals that you would see in like fucking Ocarina of Time or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. these ice crystals are very video game coded like the second you see these it's like oh if i had fire arrows i could melt these <laughs> so so we fade out to commercial as, as she and dario go down back down to the planet surface to, to check out these scrolls back in the action they are immediately freed from crystal prison <laughs> and they shatter and like a, again a very video game ass way yeah. Just several big, like, polygonal shards just shatter and just scatter all over the place. Thank you, DRDs. Thank you. So, so it's been 15 minutes uh, s- since they were, you know, crystallized, and they go to pursue. I do enjoy the, the pterodactyls in this establishing shot of, of the, the temple castle. Mm-hmm. A little bit of motion is always good. And Nilam is is trying to find a new plan, a new option, because she knows she cannot stop it. Mm-hmm. She she cannot help it. And Dargo has finally lost his infatuation. Mm-hmm. She she tells Dargo that like it's just a ship, and he corrects her that hey, Moya is not just a ship. She's alive. Uh and this is a ship who that has also, you know, saved my life three billion times already. Moya is real and strong, and she's my friend. Yeah. That little, like, lapse is uh, uh, all he needs to realize that she is no longer what an Orican should be. Yep. And this is Ka Dargo, the guy all about maintaining the roles and expectations of Luxon society. Mm-hmm. Neelam, you know, tells Dargo, like, I can't, I don't want to lose my youth. I don't, I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. And this is when... Uh, John comes down, uh, mm-hmm. and, and it's time for a face-off. Do we? Do we? Do? Yep. Yeah, because uh, Dargo comes out of Nilam's room uh, with his sword at the ready. John with you know his gun at the ready, but he slowly puts it down to the table. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Dargo lowers his lowers his sword, and John's telling Dargo that just like, hey, whatever is going to happen, we are running out of time. Because Moya is deteriorating very fast, and Pilot is essentially completely incapacitated at this point. He can't do anything. And they have a big discussion that that uh, basically boils down to intentions versus effects. Yeah, like N- Nilam did nothing to cause harm. It, it's all a big accident. It's not really her fault. And John's like, she's killing Moya, man. Yep. You you know she's killing Moya. Yep. Dargo gets very upset, like throws his sword across the room, is, you know, like crying and all this. Yes, he throws away the Qualta Blade, the symbol of those Luxon roles and expectations, Mm -hmm. which is also the the tool by which he does violence. Those two things are inseparable, and Mm -hmm. he casts them both away. And so John picks the sword back up, and he just sits down next to to Dargo, who, you know, after some, some sobbing, tells John that he came here to end this and that he will. And so John hands him the Qualta Blade back. Mm -hmm. So yes, Dargo comes into Nalam's room, who is coming to terms with the fact that she can't stay young. Yeah, yeah. 
and she she tells Dargo that you know she she's chosen her path, but she doesn't know if she's strong enough to actually go down it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that you know she needs Dargo's strength again to to be able to do what she knows she has to do. So they they kneel again together, not facing each other, but his arms wrapped around her. Uh, as he holds her hands and she holds the sword mm-hmm. and he guides her through her self impalement. Yep. Damn. Damn. Now there is a ritual that carries a fair amount of risk. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a, a drop of blood uh, falls away that resolves into a crystal that explodes into shards. Yes. And then the ground shakes once more as the Colta blade lands and clatters. Yeah, and the, the 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 little drop of blood also having like a reflection of Nilam in it. Mm-hmm. After the sword drops, you see that Nilam has reverted to her old age and it has also you know died. Uh, and Dargo gives her like one last kiss and and holds her in his arms. Remember when this episode was funny? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but after the commercial break, uh, Chiana is very happy that she's no longer stuck in goo. Yeah. And she says, I never really realized how much I love my feet. <laughs> Not just foot stuff, but we're also having more <laughs> butt jokes, yep. uh, at Rigel's expense as, as Zan is checking him over, making sure he's not too damaged by exposure to the void, uh, including his ticklish little feces. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know how you survive, Rige. Your butt must be made out of reinforced Crandak. <laughs> I have no idea what Crandak is, but if I've lost any sensation below middle level, then I'm going to test how sensitive Targo's nether regions are with a red hot. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> Take your spot. Uh, Aaron yeah, is back with Pilot again, asking him. Like if there's anything she can do to to help speed up the healing process, mm-hmm. and you know, pilot just says no. It's just got to go. You know, got to go through it. This is when Aaron gets curious and asks how long leviathans live for, mm-hmm. uh, and his answer is they generally live a little over like three hundred years. Pilots normally live o- around a thousand, but once they are bonded to leviathans, they share the same life uh, lifespan as them. And he wouldn't have it any other way. They give up so much to to travel the stars. Yep. When Pilot says that, he puts his little pincher claw on Aaron's knee. (laughs) It's cute. And she holds him for a moment. Yeah. It's very good. So, so yeah, we we catch up with John Crichton alone in the waiting room of the temple. Mm -hmm. And then he stands up, walks forward, and gazes into the empty, sun-dappled bed. Mm -hmm. And then looks to the side to see Dargo sitting alone. And he he asks Dargo, hey, like, do you want me to fuck off? Do you want to be alone? Dargo, very just like distant, just staring at the floor, asking, you know, why would I want you to do that? And John responding like, in case you wanted some alone time. And Dargo says, I do want some alone time, just not right now. Oh, Oh, oh. oh, the the best bros in space. Mm-hmm. And that's the end of the episode. That's it. That's it. So, uh, v- Vetus Mortis, I I like this one. Like, it's got man, uh, it's got like about five minutes. They're like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but then there's the rest of it. Right? It's a very silly episode for ninety five percent of the runtime. Mm-hmm. Uh, but. Uh, it's it's funny it's entertaining i like it um, like i i just really appreciate this one for how in in the beginning it presents dargo's strength that that nilam keeps talking about his strength is actually that of moya and and everyone that that rides within her but then in the end dargo's strength is the the ability to nobly commit necessary violence mhm these are the two things that make Dargo strong. Yeah. And that's good. That's good. Mm-hmm. I don't know where I heard it. Somewhere. Maybe it was in the comments, actually, of some previous episode where I was just reading that a lot of people don't like this episode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, like, when I was watching it, I was waiting for, like, the shoe to drop where it's just like, oh, the, okay, this sucks. <laughs> but it's just it's just goofy. It is that. It is. And it's like... 
with these two episodes, I actually like Vetus Mortis more than Mind the Baby. Mm -hmm. I actually had a couple problems with Mind the Baby, and it's basically like everything that happens is fine. There's something structurally about the episode that feels off to me. Um, There's something just so functional about yes. Mind the Baby. There, There is uh, just a sense that everyone needs to restate their characters and their motivations. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a lot of board setting and not a lot of delivery in Mind the Baby. Yeah, and I think because that's like one of the main functions of that episode, it kind of feels anticlimactic after the, the cliffhanger of season one being like so good. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. it's like like the the intensity and like the the interest from that didn't carry over to the 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 start of season two yeah um the the good stuff in mind the baby is um well for one brief moment i really liked uh aaron arguing with comatose zan that was great but yeah. but the the greater struggle over uh the soul and the ear of talon like that's that's mm -hmm. good. That's where the stakes are. I agree. But there there's so much that is just like, hey, we're back. Let me get you caught up. Yeah. The the yeah. rock paper scissors gag is good. Like there's a lot of good stuff, but it doesn't. Yeah, it, it's not whole. It's not complete. I yeah in, I agree. In the way, yeah. And I think yeah, on top of what you said of it, yeah, it just feels like they're kind of setting the board a lot and and just restating things to reestablish. It also feels like. Yes, I just watched an entire episode of a TV show, but it feels like it doesn't feel like a complete episode to me. It feels like I'm getting a whole lot of scenes that are all the middle of an episode. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I think that's part of maybe what what was bothering me the whole time I was watching Mind the Baby. The other thing that's just like it's not a big thing, but it bugged me was just like so yeah, the the start of this episode has like the the weird the, the the mystery and the intrigue of just like Aaron maybe possibly double crossing John and and Dargo because she's got some kind of you know mysterious deal with uh Crace and mm -hmm. what is actually going on there gets revealed pretty quickly and by the time you learn what the deal is the deal's already over basically yeah the deal's already over and also like I like the stuff revolving around John sensing that Aaron is hiding something and like that little scene of john you know convincing her like hey i know we know each other well enough now that you should just fess mm -hmm. up because i can tell something's going on they've I been close that one time <laughs> yeah i like that stuff and also that joke is funny um i feel at this point it feels weird for aaron to hide that deal from john and dargo because i feel like if she had outright told them hey i had to work with Crace to save you and this was the the trade off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I feel they would have gone okay. I understand, or at least would have been less mad than they were after learning about everything because she hid it from them. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it 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 felt a little to me like adding some intrigue just for the sake of having some. Right, right. And yeah. if you're gonna do that, I wish the reveal was something bigger and more juicy, and it didn't happen like ten minutes into the episode. <laughs> Um, so it doesn't entirely work for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I th th those are kind of my my main issues with Mind the Baby. I am. It does set up a lot of stuff. I'm interested to see a lot more of though, especially the the stuff with Talon. I really want to see what goes on with Crace and Talon. Oh, also just another a, a small thing I noticed in Vetus Mortis is John's hair is different now. Yeah, it's a little more. Early two thousands. It looks like the a little year bit of, two thousand happened. It's it, happening right it's, now. Yeah. There's a there's a little bit of gel in there. I think it's not on the mm -hmm. level of DK. It's it's the laundry fluid. It's uh, <laughs> yeah yeah. It's the Amnexus fluid or whatever the hell it's he, called. He slipped and fell in there. Then kind of liked what it did for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Hear, hearing that season two is weirder. I'm very excited to see what that means. Some weird shit's already happened. Mainly uh. The fact that Talon is installed with a claw that jams a computer chip <laughs> into your neck, and that's good. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> that's pretty wild. 
Like what? One of our most important characters for what everybody is doing and cares about is a spaceship that's going through a rebellious teen phase. Is pretty weird. That's you don't see that every. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, uh, things are going to get notably weird. Uh, uh, famously weird, in fact, in our next episodes Ooh. topics episodes three and four of the second season taking the stone and crackers don't matter if you want to be sure you're going to hear those as soon as you can the best thing you can do is become a donor become a patron at patreon.com slash chip and ironicus again mm-hmm. at any level in any amount you're going to get space puppets coming at you every week But yeah, if you have enjoyed being with us today or through season one, uh, both, I hope, uh, tell somebody about it. Share the links around. Uh, We are helping by accident and a little bit by plan commemorate the 25th anniversary of of Farscape here with this show. And we would love to uh, find people who are just getting into it now or we're always curious about it or who have been. Uh, uh, stoking the flames for this uh, quarter century of uh, a beloved, uh, lovable, scrappy little show. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, I gotta get going because humana, 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 awuga. <laughs> I'm into ladies with big heads. <laughs> I don't know if this got picked up on my mic, but uh, I am sending you a time code right now. Uh, (laughs) uh, I accidentally burped at the goddamn mic. (laughs) There you go. Okay. If you want to edit that out. Okay. (laughs) Or sell it as a ringtone. Yeah.